Live from Las Vegas, it's The Q, covering HPE Discover 2017. Brought to you by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Hey, welcome back, everyone. We're live in Las Vegas for SiliconANGLE Media's The Q, our flagship program where we go out to the events and extract the signal noise. I'm John Furrier, my co-host Dave Vellante. We've got two great guests now, Bob Moore, Director of Server Software and Product Security at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and James Morrison, a computer scientist at the FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, great to have you on. Thanks for coming on, I really appreciate it. It's always Absolutely. good to have uh, people from the FBI. And by the way, stop investigating me. Okay, <laughs> fine. We'll call it off. I think you know that all the time. I'm going to have a tomorrow. <laughs> great, seriously, thank you for coming on. Security's huge, um, cyber crime. I mean, this is something that's going on. Whether it's uh, terrorists, you know, mowing people over in London, you see that. That could have been t uh, prevented with good some computer forensics. Uh, cyber crime, whether it's identity theft to hacking. I mean, this is our moment as a, as a global economy where security in digital is a huge issue. Right, I mean, and we, what we're trying to say now is that, and this is our, our challenge over the next generation. You know, so for the FBI, cyber crime is our second highest priority after terrorism. And we are really trying to empower not only companies, but individuals to say, you know, take, take, take heed that these threats are coming your way. And whether it's ransomware, which we, we suspect 90% of ransomware is hitting individuals and small companies, or whether it's a, a true breach by a, another nation state, um, there's, no way, there's no way to avoid it anymore. And we, so we've got to buy the hardware and the software to help out. So take us through, obviously everyone sees the headlines with Trump and Comey and the whole nine yards, but this is a, like a huge staff within the FBI that's doing, has been doing work for many, many generations. But now that we're in digital, what are some of the conversations and priorities internally? You mentioned you know, terrorism, obviously number one, and cyber threats. What, I mean, I must be like, amazing staffing challenge for you guys to have the data scientists, to have this, these forensics. How do you keep up with the, with the shift? Well, that's, that's a huge, you're right, that's a huge challenge. And, and the computer scientist positions that I'm in are brand new. Uh, we just created the computer scientist uh, in 2012. Director Muller realized that we had sort of a need for that kind of a cyber, technical cyber investigator. And right now we have 120 of us nationwide in 56 field offs. This is not very many. Um, and we're trying to increase our numbers, but, um, some of our statistics show that we cannot, it, it can't be a money thing for our computer scientists. So we really try to talk to them about yeah. what is, you know, you know, for the country and, 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 and challenge them with things you'll never see anywhere else because our job, with, especially with computer forensics and reverse engineering malicious software, are jobs you're not going to see out in the, in the civilian world. And so that's really what we try so to do. So it's unique and you're looking for certain kind of individuals that might have an affinity towards really getting down and dirty into, absolutely, into some absolutely. of the computer science. And so we, stuff. and we pull, we grab, we about half our group are kids straight out of college. Um, you know, we got some of them that Mostly are- Mostly gamers, I can imagine, right? <laughs> we, you know, it's kind of funny. It's, um, you know, I talk to, I talk to you know, college kids all the time and, and um, the Bureau over time has relaxed some of its drug things, mainly because of that same sort of the kind of the subculture of, of gamers. So yeah, well, there's a whole bunch of gamers. It, it gets kind of geeky at times, but. <laughs> so it's such a complicated problem. Uh, we were talking off camera, uh, James was saying that the spending has shifted from the perimeter to other places, whether it's detection or you know, yeah. other processes. So Bob, how is HP sort of responding to these threats and the sort of mega trends? I guess what trends are you seeing and how are you responding to them? Yeah, well, uh, you know, certainly uh, as James was talking about, we see this uh, cybersecurity crime just going up exponentially. And we actually started uh, to see this, we predicted it a few years ago when we started designing our Gen 10 servers. And so what we're doing now is delivering this new revolutionary, new security protection uh, technology as part of those servers. And it's this defense in depth. We can't have just a perimeter any, any, any longer. It's protection, detection, and then recovery. And so we, because we're in such a unique position at HPE, because we design and develop our own HPE custom ILO silicon chip, we can actually do some things that, that other competitors can. So we're providing a silicon route of trust or anchoring all of our server essential firmware uh, into the silicon, and so it's, you know, you can't just. So what are some of the things that you guys do that the competitors can't? Give an example. Yeah, so the first thing we can do is we control the silicon, and so we can embed uh, or anchor all of our firmware right into the silicon, and so if anybody inserts a virus or malware into our server at any point in time, it'll change some of the bits and bytes. It won't match up with the silicon because that's immutable, it can't be changed, and then it will detect that. So we'll actually be able to tell customers, hey, there's something that's been inserted into your server. And then we take it one step further, we can actually then recover because we got this 
good state, this good firmware that's stored off. And so we the anomaly control. comes in on the silicon is like the like the ground zero, if you will, for the it's the very the basic state of truth. yeah it's a very basic bedrock. And some of our competitors are doing other things. They're protecting the BIOS and stuff like that. But we really go all the way down to the concrete, the bedrock uh, foundation of the server. That's right, and then we protect all the way up through. Okay, so let's unpack that a little bit. I, I mean, I feel like you know Stuxnet changed the game, right? It went from sort of pranks to really serious cybercrime. Now maybe that's just sort of a casual observer, not <laughs> knowing the inside baseball well enough, but nonetheless, it was a stealth sort of it you know, was, worm. You know, right? yeah. And so are you suggesting that, that you, can, you can solve that problem? Because it's really a problem of detection, right? Maybe it is, you can so, help us so that would not happen. What happened with Stuxnet, uh, which was, uh, I think it's fairly public now, is that they got in and it was really a classic denial of server where denial of service, where you're using that server for something other than its intended purpose, and they were spinning the centrifuges up for right. two or three times the speed. Wouldn't happen with Gentech, could not. Couldn't so you, can you would detect that anomaly? We would. A we would, first of all, protect from it, and if it actually got inserted like they did in the case of Stuxnet, even though those servers were air-gapped, we would detect that, absolutely. It would be a, a malware in, in the firmware that we detect. And so how do you see your customers sort of addressing this? Because I, 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 what you hear from security organizations, CISOs, is, we're so swamped, you know, we get right. so many anomalies and we're sure. just backed up. Okay, so how do you help them? So what, take us through this sort of anatomy of, okay, so you're, you're assuming a breach is going to happen, which is probably a good assumption. Yeah. Uh, and, and, okay, then what happens when you detect that anomaly? How do you, your customers right. deal with so it? So we detect the, the breach when and if it happens, and, and hopefully it doesn't, but you know, invariably, you know, it will at some it will. point in time. Yeah. We know so, that, right. But we're ready for that, and then we're providing the customer the, the ability to detect it uh, through the ILO audit log, and then also a SIM tool that would be operating like ArcSight or Splunk on the top of that. So they'll know that it's there, and then we give them a choice. Do you want to just take that server offline and you know, do some forensics on it, or would you like to actually go and do a full recovery? In which case, we can get that system back and operational because we'll recover the whole system. So you don't ever have to worry about getting a brick server or, or a denial of service because we'll recover to a known good state. So if my, if my softball wiki, I might not we prioritize it as much, but if it's the financials of the organization, you I might fence it and take yeah. it offline. Well, you know, I think the security really transcends almost all industries now. You, everybody's concerned about it, certainly in the federal sector and FSIs, but right. even if you're in retail, you don't want to be the next customer whose brand equity gets damaged because you've had a cyber breach, and so it, we, we help provide that. And we have a really comprehensive approach to it from cradle to grave, all the way from the life cycle, very beginning of the product when we embed this into the silicon and then take that uh, server all the way through the supply distribution channel. Where, where are the threats coming from? Well that's kind of, you know, and that's what's changed that you're talking kind of Stuxnet. So, you know, 10 years ago, there were a few countries that were kind of, you know, always spoken about. Um, and that's completely changed now. Um, some reports say there's as many as 200 different countries, uh, criminal groups, uh, terrorist organizations are now active in, cy in the cyberspace. Um, so it's coming from all over. It's, and, and that number's not going to go down. Um, it's too easy now to take a, a kid out of college, uh, you know, make him or her uh, you know, kind of sympathetic to a cause, and then turn them into a hacker. It, it's very simple. And you know, we, we were kind of talking. Tools are getting easier, just the double edged sword. This is the well, underbelly of the we were, uh, innovation. Well, I, was, I was talking to a, <laughs> a security guy, and he said, you know, you can buy ransomware as a service. So you can go out there on the dark web and you can purchase a, a ransomware attack against a target or a denial of service attack. I can purchase that. So it's, so it's not going to slow <laughs> I down. Some, I got some gags I can pull on some of my friends. <laughs> well, you know, it's kind of the joke of, you know, uh, the, the kid who gets upset about, you know, a game on, you know, a PlayStation decides to do it, you know, hire a denial of service attack because of it. So it, it's, it's, But that's going you know, on, this kitty script as he used to call it, but now what right. you're seeing is essentially these, the... It's a the, business. It's a business. And so it's, it's and, and it, there is a business now of, of malware. And there are, there are groups out there that are, that's all they're doing is they're developing software that they can then sell to other people to be used for a malicious. What about inside jobs? I mean, I've read some statistics still, that people will, will sell their access for a you know, thousand bucks or something. And, and so when we, when we educate customers and talk about you know, talk, our consumers, we say, never ignore that. Um, you know, there's a statistic that says that there is a percentage, a significant, maybe as much as a third of cyber incidents are from inside. A person who's disgruntled, a person who uh, is, you know, not, uh, you know, is getting ready to leave and go to a competitor, uh, or somebody who's offered that money, that number, and, and there is always that belief that people have a price. So 
So what are you guys investigating now? Because this is interesting. Dave talked about backing up the anomalies. You guys must have backlog on, on jobs you're investigating. Well, yeah. I mean, well, when, so, where's the line? Because some people try to hide under the line of where the resource is. So I'm assuming HP Solution helps you with resource, obviously, with the servers. But how do you guys uh, focus your attention? It's, it's uh, somewhat based upon, I mean, national security is probably our primary. And for, you know, for years, that was really where most of the cyber investigations were aimed at. But we've really turned a corner on, especially with the rise of ransomware. Um, so like in the Houston office, we, uh, for years we had a national security cyber squad. And then we had two. And then we recently created a, a criminal ransomware cyber security squad because of the rise of that. And so if we looked at it from a statistics standpoint, our guys doing the criminal side are way more busy than the national security. But that's, that's sort of the primary. We, we really are still looking at from an What's the co technology collaboration? Because I could imagine, certainly obviously you have the, the suppliers and HP having great silicon kind of level of security, but the banks, I mean, I was talking about me being hacked on uh, my credit card. There's all these credit cards out in the wild, as you know. Right. So the, the private sector is motivated because it's a trillion dollar just on credit card fraud. Yes. Plus. Yes. So how are you guys working with, uh, uh, from a technology and collaboration standpoint with, with private sector? Well, so like one of the things that we've done is, is uh, the FBI has ran a group called InfraGuard, uh, I-N-F-R-A-G-A-R-D, and that's a collaboration where we're really trying to create the relationships ahead of crime. Um, what we always tell people is that the FBI always responded to crime, and that may not necessarily help a company, mm -hmm. um, you know, make them feel better. And so this is where, you know, Director Comey was really big about getting ahead of it and being proactive and, and engaging, you know, the, you know, engaging with It's companies. the minority report. Yeah, uh, well, I won't say <laughs> that. free crime. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that's our hope is at the very least to try to get to the point of, of education ahead of it. And also, a lot of times with, with cyber incidents, there is a reconnaissance phase. There are earlier phases in the attack that if, if the company recognized that this was occurring, they may be able to deny, to, you know, to, you know, stop the breach before it gets really bad. And that's really what we're trying to do. So it's awesome what HPE's doing, the chip level security, and it, it's fundamental to how we have to solve this problem. However, I'm concerned that, the, that organizations don't focus enough on security, and they think, oh, <clears throat> that's somebody else's problem. Right. Oh, HPE's got that covered. You know, <laughs> they've magically fixed my you know, problem, and it'll go away. But that's not the case, right? I mean, boards, have to really pay attention to this well, problem. Well, you, you know, we were kind of talking about it before, is, I mean, it still comes down to the end user. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really does. I mean, most of the security breaches we see come down to somebody clicking on a link, somebody with a bad password, and so that's, that's where we've, we're kind of getting this holistic approach of computer security doesn't begin when you walk in the door. And, and with people now with the rise of mobility and everybody, you know, so now mo traffic on the internet is greater than 50% of uh, traffic on the internet is now coming from phones and tablets, from mobility and a lot of companies have embraced the BYOD or they're, they're embracing mobility. With that, how do you balance a person bringing their personal phone in and they're on their phones checking personal email, checking you know, you know, their Facebook, and then at the same time they're on your corporate network downloading corporate data and this, is, becomes, the, this becomes the pivot point of, of security. So that's really what we're trying to do is you know, educate the user. That's, it starts at home. It starts with your personal security goes all the way through your life cycle as well. Bob, talk about the servers now, because uh, this is interesting. So, uh, a buyer of servers now has an opportunity. When did this start rolling out for HP? What's the, what was the point in time, I mean, obviously where you have this, and, and it's highly yep. differentiated, I'm assuming, right? Yes, it is. It's, uh, it's something that no one else offers, so we're really proud about that. We did start several years ago developing this as part of our Gen 10. That's when we were implementing the Silicon Route of Trust. We've also implemented the, the, the strongest security ciphers that are available in the world today, and it's the commercial national security algorithms, and so we're incorporating that, and we're the first to do that as well. So we've started this, we've seen the trend coming, we plan for it, now we're delivering and announcing uh, this week the world's most secure industry standard server. So that's a pretty big claim, and, uh, and it's one thing for us to say, but we've actually gone outside to an external security firm and, and verified that, so we're really comfortable with that. So this is in the Gen 10? For Gen 10, so yes. So this is new for Gen 10, not Gen 8, 9. It's right, like not retroactive, new. it's brand, although those uh, platforms are certainly secure, this yes. is new revolutionary technology for just Gen 10 going So forward. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming, why wouldn't I just buy a, a truckload of these? I mean, this is like, I, a, you know, we encourage customers that. out there. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, this is a unique security feature 
built in. I'm telling you, if, you have, if you're a consumer, if you're a customer and you've got the choice between uh, some other brand of server or something that's actually the world's most secure industry, why wouldn't you go that direction? Because when that breach comes, Dave, like you're talking about, uh, you're protected. And when, it, when you look at trying to comply with a lot of regulations like the EU, the GDPR that's coming up uh, in mid-May 2018, uh, you have to show a good faith effort toward compliance and buying state-of-the-art technology qualifies. I mean, my assessment would be that this would be the, the uh, like John said, buy a truckload of these things, but then there's other prerequisites that I would recommend to people, like make sure that you have the ability to understand the value of those assets and be able to prioritize those anomalies that you're going to detect because yes. you're probably going to increase the incoming volume of data that I now have to analyze. So make sure you have some other tail end tooling well, that's kind of what we were talking that. about is that throughout. Is a fair assessment? Yeah, I think it's the rise so, of data. Yeah, yeah, and so if you implement some type of a SIM tool that's fairly, and we've uh, we've uh, created a unique connector with the ArcSight uh, SIM tool that helps provide that scanning and, and determine what anomalies are occurring inside the server, and we'll pick up on some of those right. uh, yeah. malicious firmware. Well, we'll uh, certainly uh, be following the results and the benchmarks. Certainly, the laws are moving in compliance. Is yeah. kind of a pain in the butt for most customers, but they got to get it done. And then security, you've used the product, have you used the Gen 10? Uh, no, not, not yet. We, we, our, our requirements all come out of our headquarters. Okay. So, I mean, it's definitely one of those things where they evaluate uh, because our, you know, we were kind of talking about, you know, now that there's a new requirement, um, we will let our headquarters kind of determine, you know, what yeah, yeah. fits their need. Um, I, I well, luckily, I don't do procurement, thank goodness. Get a, get a truckload. <laughs> yeah, get a truckload, right? right? Just tell so, them I need yeah. more security. Hey, congratulations, and thanks for sharing the insight into what's going on with the FBI. Great work. The Absolutely. priorities, and I know you guys are, are continually stepping up. Um, I think I'm a young kid these days. I want to work for the, some of the cool things that are going on in cyber, cyber yeah, army. Right. We, we were joking last night with Chris Shue, there should be a cyber West Point. Well, and you know, there, now I Cyber like Command that. is new. There is Cyber Command. Cyber Command was stood up by the Army, yeah. and that's the, uh, uh, you know, and these kids are coming in, they're actually talking about not let, letting them go to uh, boot camp. Yeah. There's Having actually gone a, to West you know, Point myself, yeah. I can tell you that's a great idea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot of great, yeah. I mean, this is, this is a new dimension Absolutely. of forces uh, and, and to protect our, in every country. Right. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. This is theCUBE bringing you all the action here, the security conversation, all the live commentary here on theCUBE. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. We'll be right back with more live coverage from HPE Discover 2017 after this short break. Stay with us.